because my daughter has no voice. She was murdered last week when she was taken from us. Shot nine times on the third floor. Now, we, as a country, failed our children. This shouldn't happen. We go to the airport. I can't get on a plane with a, a bottled water, but we leave it. Some animal could walk into a school and shoot our children. It's, it's just not right, and we need to come together as a country and work on what's important, and that's protecting our children in the schools. That's the only thing that matters right now. Meadow Pollock. She was one of 17 people to die almost to the date on February 14th, 2018 at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida. I think all of us remember that day. All of us that were watching the news in horror. I was going to open up my podcast, you know, doing the regular spiel, talking about the daily news, joking around. But I got into an interview that's coming up with Andrew Pollack, the father of Meadow Pollock, and I couldn't do it. Jenny Tear is here with me, and um, I have Adam in the control booth, and none of us, I mean, we were just stunned for the first time. Andrew described every moment that was described to him, and I'll explain why in a minute, of the last moments of his daughter's life. This is the first time that he's ever discussed it. It's based off of video surveillance inside the school that, in fact, he has never seen, but his very close friends have, and they've advised him not to. But he describes her heroics and why he should be so proud to have a daughter like Meadow and why her memory is so important and why her life and then her death is going to save the lives of so many of our children. I tell you, listeners, I have, I have never felt this moved by an interview and by a father who I know, like, as a mother, I just can't even imagine losing my child and then having to continue to go on and to talk about it. Uh, and fight for other children's lives. But that's exactly what he is doing. I'm, you know, I'm not going to go on and on and on because I want you to hear this interview because it touched me deep in my soul. I know it will you. And I want you to remember what a hero Meadow Pollock was. And she still is to this day in her memory. But I want you to know what a hero this young lady was who gave her life at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School that day. Hi, Andrew. Are you there? Yep, I'm here, Sarah. Good morning for me. Uh, yeah, good morning to you, too. And uh, thanks so much for being on the Sarah Carter Show. You know, this is a very special interview for me because I have been following your story so closely since 2018. I mean, I think it sent a shock through our nation the shooting um, at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School where you lost your beautiful daughter, Meadow, uh, on February 14th, 2018. And uh, we're almost two years to the date. And I just want to start out with a little bit about Meadow. I'd, I'd love for you to just talk to me about who she was. I, I don't want her to be just a number or just a name, but I really want to know who Meadow was, who she was in your life, her favorite color, what she loved to do, what she wanted to be. You know, those things are what interest me. Sure. Meadow was kind soul. You know, she was always a person that would light up a room. And when new students came to the school and the high school, she'd always be the first one to introduce herself. And, and she was very kind hearted. Uh, she was my youngest and my only daughter. And, you know, it's not a second that goes by that I don't think about her. 
you know, she had me wrapped around her finger, but <laughs> she was, she was the toughest man. She was like, she was the most like me. I, I, I consider myself pretty tough, from, uh, you know, not just tough and calloused from growing up in New York and metal, which uh, she took after me the, the most, uh, even more than my two sons. Uh, she was, she knew what, she, if she wanted something in life, she knew how to get it. And there was nothing that was going to stop her. And she was inspiring uh, to go to law school. Uh, she was she, another two and a half months. She would have been graduating. And, and that mm -hmm. never happened. She was the youngest of 10 cousins. Uh, the last one to would have graduated out of that school, out of the, out of the 10 of them. And well, we all know what happened. And we, all of us know it really affected a lot of people. Uh, it affects me on a daily basis uh, and my, my whole family. And we miss it terribly. And it's, it's just a horrible situation uh, that any, you know, that you have to live with. Uh, it's hard to explain it. Uh, you never heal from it. It's, and I'm glad you're not, you didn't mention like it's an anniversary. Uh, to me, an anniversary is something that, that's a, a happy occasion. Uh, when you met someone, a marriage, uh, something like that. To me, to, when they call it an anniversary, uh, I don't get it. You know, an anniversary should be something, a, a happy occasion. I don't need people calling it an anniversary for me to remember that my daughter was murdered on, on that day. You know, I, I, I live with it constantly. And but that's she, you literally know, it's, it. It's crazy. Well, no, yeah. that's literally it. I, I didn't call it an anniversary because losing someone in your life, having someone ripped from your life uh, without any expectation, without any knowledge that something like this is going to occur is – is it sends shock waves not only through the family um it is something that it, i i know this you know is haunting and it stays with you forever and that's why i wanted and i want our listeners to know who this beautiful wonderful human being was and how she still here changing lives and saving lives through you and through your family by her memory yeah, you know, my, a lot of people don't know when Meadow was uh, shot. It's so hard, you know, for me to talk about it. You know, Meadow was shot first like uh, four times. Sorry, but it's just tough. Uh, four times she was shot uh, first on the third floor. The teacher let Meadow out into the hallway. Uh, she heard the fire alarm. I, I got really unlucky uh, with everything. She, her teacher uh, had a very low IQ. Uh, 90 rounds went off uh, in that building, and it shook the building, and the fire alarm went off from the smoke it exhausts uh, when you shoot a weapon. Any gun uh, expels uh, you know, fumes, and it, let, it set off the fire alarm. So the teacher heard, they heard 90 rounds, and the teacher let Meadow out into the hallway, even even with the rounds going, hearing rounds go off. And then, so Meadow got shot down the hallway for, uh, four, five times. And then the teacher locked, the teacher shut the door, and then Meadow couldn't get back in the classroom. She locked this, she locked Meadow out. And then Meadow uh, crawled over to another doorway where there was another student there, Kara. And Meadow tried to shield her, even though she was shot. And then, uh, you know, he came down the hallway and shot her another four times, and the bullets went through my daughter, killed, killed Kara underneath that. So, wow, this is this is what I live with, you know. So she really did. She died a yeah, hero. Yeah. So she, yeah. I mean, that's it was brutal. You know, nobody, not many people know it, but I, I know that because there was cameras in the hallway and uh, they they told me, the detectives and who watched it, they couldn't believe it. She was an amazing, an amazing young woman. And it's hard for me. I listen to your story and I think about my daughters. I think about my kids. And what goes through your mind is like, how how did I not know that there was this this guy at school, I, I don't even want to say his name. I know I have to because people uh, won't we know. Call him that. Yeah, you call, I call him the killer. I the go killer. By, you know, I don't really care if you call him by his name. I, I, I just call him a piece of shit. But, you know, he, he's going to get his one day. 
and it's coming. You know what I mean? But a lot of people didn't know that what what had happened in in, the, in that hallway, and and because a lot of it, uh, you know that that video hasn't been shown yet. I hope it never comes out of uh, what my daughter get murdered, but I, I don't know. It's possible. I, I couldn't watch it. I, I didn't watch it. My friends told me not, you know, uh, they sat on that commission, the MSD commission that was formed to look into the failures. So uh, they had to all see it. And but they I, saw it. I, what I did, did, what did they, it. I know you didn't see it. And I, 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 I'm I'm with you on that. I probably would not have seen it either as a parent. I don't think I could I could handle that. Um when you think about how your daughter reacted that morning and then the cowardness of Sheriff Israel's team when they showed up to the high school, what goes through your mind? Uh just a failed political system that got uh, the sheriff was just uh, politicized the whole department. Uh, a lot of those guys in, uh, that stood down, like, how do you not, like, what kind of piece of garbage uh, do you have to be to pull up to a school and you hear rounds going off and you don't go in the building? You know, it wasn't just one coward. There was about four of them that didn't go in and they heard the shots coming from a school and you don't go in a building. You know, a couple of the coaches went in unarmed. They got kept murdered, right. but you know there's kid kids in there, and they had a chance to stop it. Some well, the one guy, the deputy Peterson, who's brought up on felony charges now uh, because we pushed it the issues uh, of accountability. He's brought up on felony charges, uh, child neglect, for not going in the building. But a lot of people don't know. Four other deputies pulled up and didn't go in the building either, and. You could see it on their body cam. You, you hear the shots, you know, because it has it had sound from their body cam, and they're they're uh, they're hiding behind their cars while there's shots going off inside a school building. So it's got it's ridiculous. Are the other but four going to be brought up on charges as well, or do you know what's going no, on with that? No, they just got they got fired, and the That's only right. reason they got fired was because I worked with uh, the campaign uh, Governor DeSantis to get Governor DeSantis elected in Florida, and he ran on holding people accountable in his campaign, and I, and I worked really hard on it, and he won, and he held people accountable. He removed that sheriff. Like the first month in office, he took that Sheriff Israel out and put a new sheriff in who's, a real, uh, who's about being a, a real law and order sheriff, and he did an investigation, and they ended up firing four of them of the deputies that didn't go in. Uh, a couple resigned. It was like a captain that resigned that was like walking around scratching her head while everything was going on. A lieutenant resigned. And, and this Peterson, he got uh, charged with felony, but also in my wrongful death case, uh, he appealed it. Like he said he had no duty to go in and save those kids on the third floor. Because uh, he, he was, he went, not, sorry, he was nine feet from the door when the murderer was on the first floor. So he could have, he could have went in and most of the time they kill themselves. It's not like a shootout. They either kill themselves or give up. So, but he went, they drove him to the door. They told him he was inside and then he retreated to where he hid behind the wall for 40 minutes. So on the first floor, he, he, he couldn't have stopped the, him from shooting on the first floor, but he definitely would have stopped them from going to the third floor. That's where Meadow was, and I think another six or seven people got murdered on the third floor. And he hid for forty three minutes. So he and we he saw the video of that. Stuff. Remember, the video of that was out there where we could see this deputy hide. I mean, he basically didn't even bother going inside. We could see him hiding, crouched. Yep, he hid with his gun drawn, and he, not only did he hide, he also misinformed some other first responders. Right. You know, uh, but he, because uh, I have a friend that came up to the building. Uh, it would have been too late, though, by the time they showed up. But he was like, wasn't telling him. He didn't tell one of my buddies to go in the building who was a police officer because he said to me, Andy, if I would have, if he told me he was in the building, I would have went in and then he would have had to come in with me. So he was so scared of going in that building that he misinformed one of the policemen, when they, another one, when they pulled up to the building. 
because he didn't want to go in. That's how much of a chicken shit this guy was. Well, that makes and me he, think uh, as a parent. That makes me think as a parent, like, what could happen at my child's school? What happens if well, these same untrained, unskilled law enforcement officers show up, you know, and there's somebody in there that is an active shooter? That's why, you know, over the last two years, I learned so much, you know, from meeting with politicians and what you could get done at a federal level or a local level and the differences between uh, different departments and private schools and charter schools and 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 homeschool. You know, these uh, some of these departments, you know, they they'll put people that are in 30 years. Uh, being a police officer, they stick them out of school because they think nothing's ever going to happen. You know, they call those guys ROD, retired on duty. You know, they, they're just uh, they collecting their pension and they want their last few years, so they'll stick them out of school. And I, that's what happened at my daughter's school with the whole department uh, in that area. They were all people like in their last their last years towards retirement, and they stuck them in that area, the sheriff, and then none of them went in. So it's important for parents to learn and know what's going on in these schools with their offices, what type of security they have at the schools, and more important, who are these schools allowing? You know, what I found right. out in one of in my deposition, Sarah, you won't. They had to, you know, in my wrongful death case, uh, we deposed people at the school. So one of the security guards, his job was every morning he had to frisk the killer every morning, if you can believe it. It was okay that he went to school with my daughter. They, to put a guy in a school that was so dangerous, they had to frisk, but they never told any of the parents. He wasn't allowed in with a backpack, the killer, and he had to be frisked every morning. But they think that was okay, that this this animal went to school with my, with my daughter. That's what I wanted to talk to you about, because a lot of people in the audience really don't know a lot about, and I'm going to say his name, and I'm not going to say it often, you say it. But, it's gonna, but Nicholas Cruz. And he was such a disturbed psychopathic young person he was at west glades middle school and even the teachers there were stunned that he was allowed in to marjorie stoneman douglas high school they couldn't even believe it in fact one of the teachers um and there was notes and i believe they are listed in your book as well um and i i definitely at the top of the show why meadow died Please, parents, even if you're not a parent, get this book to understand what's going on in our country and to understand what happened to the families that lost their children that day and the teachers and the people that by the hands of this killer, this killer, um, while he was in middle school, I mean, there was a list of problems. I mean, this this person had been a problem probably since birth. Um, yes. And was fascinated by death. He talked about skinning animals. He videotaped himself doing these things. He was, I mean, by any means, he should have been admitted into a hospital when he was very young. Um, and now he was allowed to roam the hallways of your daughter's school. And nobody knew it. Not the parents, at least. And not the students. Oh, buddy. You want to hear something crazy, a crazy fact that, uh, that, that no one really knows this. So the killer was adopted, right, uh, from I think his mom was about 50 and the father was 60, right, from a, from a crackhead mother who has been in, must have been, has like 17 arrests or at least. So they take this baby from a crackhead that's addicted to drugs and has issues like something wrong with it, right? Mm-hmm. Mentally, emotionally disturbed, violent. And then two years later, they adopt the baby again from the same crackhead mother. Could you what? with a different father? Oh yeah, from a different father. So they that's so they were half brothers. I don't even know what you call it. Uh, so they adopted one from the crackhead, and then uh, a year or two later. At age 52 and 60 something, they adopt another kid from the same mother who was on drugs and in and out, in and out of jail. Who I think she's still, is she dead? Oh, she's still in, she's still in, and I don't even know what, what, whatever happened to her, but she was a, a drug addict and had another baby, and they took that baby too. That, that's the parents that, with this kid who also took him to buy a rifle after he's skinning animals and killing birds in the backyard. 
talking about see, killing people. See, this is it, America. This is what – this is the real story. And I know the listeners, a lot of this I've never even heard before, but this is what's happening yep. here. We don't know all the facts. And this is not This is about giving somebody who is mentally ill access – it's like even a car would be dangerous in his hands. I mean, this is somebody oh, who was so disturbed that he should have been admitted. Let me ask you this. When you talked to the school afterwards or if you spoken to any of the teachers, did they answer you? Did they say why they allowed him to continue coming to school even though he – Obviously, other students knew that he was talking about, um, you know, all of these strange fantasies that he had going on in his head, even though the school knew that he was a potential danger. Did they even explain to you why, in their own words, between you and them, why they allowed this to continue and why they did not inform anyone? Well, students and teachers came out to me. That's why it started like I just wanted to know what happened to my daughter. So I, I was meeting with them, and then I teamed up with my co-author, Max Eden, who wrote the right. book with me. He's an expert in education policy. He came down just to do a story, but it, it ended up there was so much that we turned it into a book. So teachers spoke to me and students. The school board, they did nothing wrong, Sarah. You know, they didn't do anything wrong. You know, uh, I'm I'm in court with them, and that's where you get accountability the only place in life really is in the courtroom so we actually had a hearing uh with with the judge about a month or two ago that they don't think anything prior to february 14th should be admissible they only screwed up that day and they don't want anything uh being coming out from prior february 14th that was my hearing about a month and a half ago with the judge so that's insane. Hard. Yeah, it is insane. But I want parents to know what's going on because I, it, no one should have to put their child through what I did. And, and I live with it, sending it to that school. So there's two big issues going on with the public schools. One is they take, and this is in my book, one is they, they take, uh, they'll take someone, right? And you know how they, they label kids special needs. You hear that right. word before. Like a but so when most parents like yourself and, 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 and me, when we think of special needs, you think of a child with cerebral palsy, right. autism, dyslexic, something like that. Blind, in a violent. wheelchair, something. Exactly. That, you know. But what happened is they take kids that are emotionally disturbed and violent, not even just emotionally disturbed, emotionally disturbed and violent, and they label them in that American Disabilities Act. And they put them and they label them special needs and they put those kids with our children in the public schools. And that's what's one of the biggest problems with the public school system, that they take these children. And that's why it's not a surprise. There's no why are there's no shootings in private schools because they don't take those type of kids emotionally disturbed and violent. And so you take that, and then you take those Obama era leniency policies. That's what I was going to talk to you about. Kids accountable. Let's not hold kids accountable. Okay, let's let's coddle them. Let's put them in programs and don't show them accountability. So you take that, and then you take emotionally disturbed, violent children, and you put them two together. Then you have school shootings. You have bullying, and you just create a, an environment that you don't want to put your kid in. So. To me, like when I get a, a, a when someone DMs me and say, "Andy, I read the book. I see what's going on. I took my kid out of the public school system." I get pleasure. That's like one thing I get pleasure out when a, when a parent tells me that they they see what's going on in the public schools and they take them out. Wasn't you know, there a financial account, incentive, Andrew? Wasn't there a financial started, incentive for the Obama administration too for the school systems under that regulation that let's well, not hold the kids the, accountable? Yeah. Yeah, let's. They had a dear colleague letter that came out with Arnie Duncan and uh, Eric Holder when he was uh, attorney general, and they threatened to cut off federal funding if they didn't participate in these programs of ending the school to prison pipeline. Let's not arrest kids. Let's put them in different programs. 
And what it does is creates an unsafe environment. In California right now, if uh, you have listeners there, uh, it's against the law. It's against the law in California to suspend a child for being disruptive, if you could believe it. that They made it a law now. It passed. The governor signed it. So if you're sending your kid, I, I don't even, you know, if you're a, even a Democrat, you got to think that it can't be good to put your child in that school when a kid could tell the teacher whatever he wants, throw a chair, steal your kid's phone, and have not a consequence of being suspended. And it's policies like that that are leftist policies that cause these type of situations in schools of just being unsafe. And then you got the, uh, you got emotionally disturbed, violent children. And really that's what's going on with our public schools and parents need to wake up because look, I I met with the president, the president formed a commission. He ended those policies of the Obama administration, uh, pushing that, pushing, uh, you know, not holding kids accountable, those leniency policies, the president rescinded it. But just because the president does it at a federal level, it doesn't mean focus at a local level. They're not going to listen. You know what I mean? The Nancy Pelosi's of the world that run our public schools, because they're very leftist, a lot of the public schools, they don't listen to those. They think that let's not suspend, let's not arrest, or, or, or even teach kids right from wrong at a young age, And they don't let, you know, they're going to do at a local level, they do whatever they want with their budget. The governor can't help you. The president can't help you. It's the local school board. And uh, if you can't fix that, then you you need to put your kids in a different school, private, charter or homeschool. And really, you know, they can't. People always say, well, what did the president do? What did the governor do? They they can't help at 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 a level. In your town, it's the local school boards that dictate the budget and the policies. That it is incredible. I mean, we know so little, yet we put our most because we don't we we entrust that our schools are going to protect our children. We entrust that the fact that our these I teachers, so. yeah, me too. I mean, we think that way because we're trusting good people, right? I mean, for the most part, most of us feel that way, and then we hear these stories and we think to ourselves, "My beautiful, prized possession of my life." Not my car, not my house, not, you know, the the ring on my finger, but my child, who we believe is going to get every benefit, every bit of help, you know, and that yep. we entrust you- our public schools to do this. And then we send them there and we find out that there's monsters in their school and that their teachers who are being paid with our taxpayer dollars and these school boards are not doing their job and they don't care about well, our wish- kids. Yep. Broward County, the budget's over $4 billion, the school budget in Broward County, if you could believe it. And, you know, if parents think, oh, it's only an isolated case, there's thousands of nut job kids with that are violent, emotionally uh, uh, violent. They're on those psychotropic drugs, okay, that now it lists, uh, increases homicidal ideation, it says it on those pills now. You know, uh, Nevada's has it on, uh, on their warnings that when you give these kids these ty- when you give someone who's emotionally disturbed and violent those type of psychotropic drugs, it will increase violence. And it's right on the warning labels. So these kids, and they're going right into the schools, and, and parents think it's only happened, could only happen in Parkland where I live, that was only that kid. There's thousands of kids like that. That everyone says, well, my kid's not that bad. I want to mainstream them. Let's mainstream these kids. So they mainstream these kids and they put all 99.8% of the population at risk going to the school because this one kid is labeled special needs and he has to, he's entitled to go to school with our children. So it's a big problem and it's not at private school or they, they don't take children like that. Yeah, it, it wouldn't happen there. It wouldn't happen there. I, you've done nope. a, enormous work to try to save children's lives. I know Logan Raddick, one of our writers, spoke to you and put together a story. It's on com. It's called Seconds Save Lives. Andrew Pollack reveals groundbreaking school safety plan. You are uh, basically combining forces with Intralogic Solutions. It's a company that is based out of New York. Um They've been in business since 2004, and they have a system that's called ALERT, um, which stands for Active Law Enforcement Response Technology. And this is so important because it would basically 
it's, it would basically save lives, right? Can you it talk about saved this? Every, it would have, yeah, it would have saved my daughter and everyone on that third floor 1,000%. So over the last year, though now it's two years, I'm already saying, you know, every technology company, so many of them reached out to me uh, to try and support them or or thing they or people selling stuff selling uh ballistic blackboards bulletproof glass turns uh metal detectors turnstile metal detectors all types of things that could make a difference and save lives but everything when i looked at it uh they didn't have a big platform they it, and everything would require a, a very big budget for a school system or a sheriff's department. So when it, you know, you know, and I vetted Sarah, I must've vetted at least 200 companies that, that approached me. So when Intralogic approached me, I really looked into the technology they had and what they were offering. And I would, and I said to myself, you know, if this was in place when Parkland took place, my daughter would be alive today. So what it does is, which is incredible. It could, it could, uh, inter, it could take any places, cameras, like at any school, private school, temple, church, mosque, any cameras at any facility and link them to the sheriff and, uh, or the police department. So, uh, so it does more than that though. So say that they would have called, they call 911 from a school. So within five to 10 seconds, uh, in the command center at the sheriff's office, the school pops up with a map of the whole school showing every single camera, okay? And it gives the sheriff's department access to the intercom system so they could start talking to staff or the shooter within 10 seconds. They could say, we're in the building, put your oh, weapon wow. down. We have a sniper on you. That's within five, 10 seconds. They're online and they can control all the door locking mechanisms if they have them in the school. So they would know which entrance to go into. They would know exactly where the killer was, and they would have access to the intercom. And I know, you know, they didn't reach, you know, the police didn't get to my daughter for over 40 minutes on the third floor. She was laying there. They didn't even know. Right. So seconds save lives. And in any response, this this could help. You know, I, we, we got a grant for my temple, too, in the Coral Springs. So now if there's an emergency at my temple, It'll mm -hmm. go to the police department. Coral Springs got a grant, and this is all granted. This is this is through grants. They get they getting it for free. These people, uh, so uh, it it goes to the Coral Springs PD. My temple will pop up a map. They can control the locks and talk over the intercom system to the temple within five seconds. That's an incredible so, piece of technology, and it would it absolutely would be able to save lives. Yep, I, I mean, it's uh, impossible that's to think two that years of looking at stuff and, mm -hmm. and I just and we're donating it, the software to, to, to the to the sheriff's department through these grants. So I have a, it's pretty I have a unique grant committee. I have a parent that I became, you know, friends with from Sandy Hook from the shooting. I have one from Columbine and one from Santa Fe. Uh, that's linked to these shootings now that are the working with this software company and they're on they're on the grant committee and we're issuing these grants to different police departments throughout the country. What can to, people to do down on response? What can people do to are help they, to help with these grants or to be more involved? Is there anything that the general public sure, they, can do? They could they well, you know what it is. Parents need to pressure their school boards and police departments to get the software because we're going to give it to them. But, you know, getting a school board well, uh, to get on board and wanting it, uh, it's going to be the parents that pressure them. And they could go to, uh, they could go to uh, my Twitter. I'm going to be posting applications for different school districts throughout the country. And, and they could fill out their applications and they could pressure their school, even if it's a nursery, a private little nursery school with cameras, wouldn't you want that linked to your sheriff's department? God forbid there's something. Right. The sheriff knows within five seconds what's going on. They could tell the first responders why they're en route. Uh, they could tell them what's going on at the school or, or the nursery school, wherever, wherever your children are. You want to know that they're linked to the sheriff's mm -hmm. department within five seconds. 
And let me, before I get off with you, um, Andrew, one final question. Uh, we started this conversation talking about, of course, Meadow and it being almost two years to the day since she was killed. Is there any message, is there anything you want us to know about her that maybe we don't know or a message to parents out there? Um, maybe something that over these past few years, you know, you've learned. Sure. Parents shouldn't think that it can't happen to them. You know, everyone thinks if you ask any parent that had a murdered child, they would think it couldn't happen to them. And Meadow would want every parent to know that it's possible and you shouldn't put your child in a situation um, in an unsafe situation at these schools, not knowing what's going on. And, and, and that's my, you know, over what, what I worked on with ex- getting this out and exposing it. And Meadow would want every parent to know that when you send your child to, to school, it, okay, they might not get shot, but the bullying, uh, and subjecting them to these type of children in the schools, it it it, it shouldn't be happening. And and she would want them to know that. Uh, and really, that's what I focus on now. It's parents. It's your responsibility where your children go to school. It's not the president's. It's not your governor or your senator. You decide where where you put your child. And Meta would want you putting your child in a school that takes security serious education and not having those type of kids. Those type of kids should be in special programs where they could be supervised, not in schools walking the walk in the hallways. I don't even know how to thank you for this interview. I felt like I've learned so much and so much more. And I know the audience has too, Andrew. I mean, your fight is our fight, every parent's fight to protect their child's lives. And you know, we we don't have full control of our our children's lives or even of our own. Things like this happen, but taking the necessary steps to actually protect our kids and the fact that you're doing that, and I believe saving lives is what's important here. And I can't thank you enough. I know this has probably been one of the, probably the worst thing that you've ever had to live through in your own life. And the fact that you're making good of this and that you're, informing the public you're a real hero to me andrew pollock you really you really deserve all of the credit and the um a love that our nation has to offer you because living through a child's death has got to be the the worst thing for any parent yeah but it, it, i can't there's nothing worse than it you know what i mean i'd rather i would have rather been burned alive than have this happen to me uh, and have my daughter here but you know all i could do now is fight for, uh, for 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 kids and for parents, and uh, and show parents uh, to just be open minded, uh, especially a lot of the left leaning parents. When you when you take the gun control out of it, there's a lot that could be accomplished when it comes to school safety. If you leave the debates out of it and just think what's right for your children with the software, with where you put your children what policies are in place, and uh, we could get a lot done. Well, thank you so much. You're right. We can get a lot done, and we're going to get that message out there far and wide. Again, folks, that's Andrew Pollack, and he has written an incredible, incredible book that I want you all to read, and it's Why Meadow Died. He is the author of Why Meadow Died. His daughter, Meadow Pollock, was one of 17 people to die at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. It was a shooting almost two years to the day, February 14th. Thank you so much. You can hear the passion in the desire to make a difference in Andrew Pollock's voice. You know that he is doing everything he can to save lives. And for me, he's a real hero. I mean, I don't even know after it, it was interesting. And I'm going to go to you, Adam, because uh, quickly, but it was interesting to me that, you know, it just felt like it was yesterday for him, but you could still feel that sense of rage, that anger that his daughter was just ripped from his life and that he was so blindsided by what happened. I want to go to something because you, Adam, you've worked with special needs children and um, 
I know that there's probably a lot you want to say right here. Uh, this is how Nicholas Cruz was categorized at the high school, although there was this litany of issues with him, psychological issues that should have been major red flags. What's your opinion on this? Yeah, it was a hard interview to listen to. Obviously, there's a lot of touchy information there, and I never want to tell you know, Mr. Pollock how to feel. I mean, I don't think any of us know how he's feeling right now. I, I just know that there's probably a lot of families out there that might hear that interview and maybe have a student with the categorization of you know emotional disorders or dis- disabilities and say, hey, not every kid with ED is going to end up being a murderer or, you know, the tough thing with this in any special needs situation is that the goal for kids in that group is to be included, is full inclusion. You want that to be the goal. But then you listen to Andrew talk about how, well, how, where's the cutoff? Because somebody who clearly should not right. have been included in my kid's school took her from me forever. Well, and that's what he said, right? He said, look, you know, when I think of special needs, I think of a kid, you know, with MS or somebody who has maybe ADHD or just something that you wouldn't expect it to be this violent level uh, issue where we can look back at the we look back at his past now and you say he was bragging about killing animals he videotaped the killing of animals skinning animals um, things that you only hear when people talk about serial killers or you know somebody with such a high level of violence that they broke away completely from societal norms. But the funny thing is not funny, but the odd thing is is that. There are kids who are violent in all of these – everyone who's listening in each one of those schools. There are. There are kids who are – you know, I've been – I've taught ED classrooms, folks. I mean, I remember as a substitute teacher having to break up a fight where there was a kid trying to smash another kid over the head with a stapler. I mean, this is incredible. And it happened over nothing. No. It, it happened in three seconds. And I'm jumping in the middle of it as a kid fresh out of college just trying to get sub- some substitute teaching hours. That's one story of my three years of special Now, were they needs. integrated into the um, school system? That was a classroom that was both gen- general education kids and also some special needs kids. Um, and that happens in a lot of classrooms. Well, I think what's important here is that so many parents, we send our kids to school and we have just no idea how the school is being managed, how the school is being run. Some of that's our responsibility. But I think in general, parents feel the way Andrew did before this happened at his school. It's like, I put my kid in a school. I expect the school to be safe. I expect the school to watch over my child. It's our taxpayer dollars. I entrust my child's life for eight hours a day, you know, in the school. And we think that, and I don't think unless something happens like this to us or to our country that we even question it, which is what is, what's been happening with all these school shootings. And he's right. Look, don't just talk about weapons and gun rights. and this. I mean, put all that aside. Put all that aside. There was something seriously wrong with Nicholas Cruz. And that's not indicative of what's typical in an ED classroom. Right, I right. just want to point that out. While there are kids who are violent in many schools that are, uh, right. our listeners have their kids going to, it's not to that level. And yeah, if that's, I mean, we have a clip of kids who said that it was obvious that this was this kid was going right. to do something one day. Well, he kept threatening. He kept threatening and nothing was ever done. And there was a problem at this school. Jenny, I mean, you were in high school, of course, much early (laughs) I was in high school (laughs) so long ago so long ago I don't want to bring it up um but you you know a few years ago uh what was it like at your high school I went to a public high school that was huge there were about 4,000 students which was always very alarming to me because there was no security system I mean it didn't appear as such you would think that a school like that there would be metal detectors There would be officers at every entrance, not to mention the entire rectangle of the school building had doors on every side. Um, But it was it was a school that had a lot of troubled students um, from, you know, that needed a lot of help because there was a lack of accountability. There was huge classrooms. Um, There was a lot of gang violence. That's what I was just going to ask. Was there? Did you have any pregnancies drop out? There were, I mean, there were definitely students, young mothers, um, and they did have programs for that. But I would, I I mean, I always thought 
we're, I mean, I, I'm just like counting down the day until something happens. And actually, recently something did happen. There was a shooting there, which is very, very sad. And, and a student was killed. This, oh, this wow. is private schools, folks. My my first year teaching at, at a um, at, at the school that I went to, they taught me first of all the Hispanic curse words so that I would know what the kids were saying to me, and second of all, uh, we ha- <laughs> I swear to God, that I was, would throw some out there since uh, I speak Spanish, but was, I'm not going to. You could have taught that meeting, um, but they also had uh, I think I could seven, have taught that class seventeen for many of them seventeen dropouts due to pregnancy that year alone. And this was at a public school. Public school. And yeah. I'm not, nothing against kids who drop out to raise their kids. But, I mean, no, obviously. No, come on. Your life is. I mean, I mean, if you're dropping out of school to raise a child, I mean, we see the breakdown in communities, in our society. I think the big lesson here and what, you know, Andrew, the lesson of Andrew's story, Andrew Pollock's story is exactly what he said. Parents know what your child is up against understand what's going on at their school ask them questions you know a lot of kids they may hear these stories about nicholas cruz they probably did um a lot of them probably didn't share that with their parents or maybe the parents are so busy they never even ask the right questions and it's just one of those things that kids know but they never really think about by the time they get home and they're getting ready for football or doing something else they're just not thinking about sharing this story or they're not friends with the kid but it's if parents only could arm themselves with more information, then they can work to make a difference. And I think this intralogic, I'm so excited about this new technology that he's been working with um, and this company. And I think that uh, being able to give better resources to our law enforcement agencies when something like this happens actually will save lives. And he's 100% sure after talking to so many different companies that this piece of technology would have saved his daughter's life. Public schools need all the help they can get. And that's the point that I was driving at because we don't want to take away the goal of inclusion for kids with special needs who aren't violent. Obviously, that's something that we want to keep. and We want that to be a goal because there are a lot of kids that pushing them towards that gets them there. I've seen it. Yeah, absolutely. But when you have something like this, I, I think this is a totally different kind of special need, 100%. right? You you can't have a child in school that is threatening to kill people and who have videotapes himself slaughtering animals. Not one when we have classmates saying this. Um, honestly, a lot of people were were, con- were saying that it was going to be him and stuff like that. We actually we threw a lot of kids do jokes around like that, saying that he was the one to screw up for school. But it, it turns out, you know. Everyone predicted it. It's it's that's crazy. Wow, he must have come onto campus, right? Yeah, he was on the third floor. He knows the school layout. He knows where everyone would, would be at as of right now. He he's been in his old fire drills. He's prepared for this stuff. Wow, it's just hard to hear. Well, it is hard to hear. I just hope um, all of you out there listen. I I'm going to wrap this up because I just don't think. I mean, we could talk about this forever. Um, I think as parents, it's important for all of us. I know I'm going to take it upon myself to make sure I understand what the policy is at my daughter's school for anything and everything that can happen. I feel like I'm pretty educated on that, but I don't know everything. And I hope you do, too. And listen, thank you, Andrew Pollock. Thank you for taking your daughter's memory and saving lives with it. And thank you for keeping her alive. And thank you for telling me her story. And thank you, America, for being here at the Sarah Carter Show. And I hope you got something from this. I hope it helps save lives in your community and in schools across the country. Let's get together. Let's work together. Let's stop fighting each other. Let's make this happen. Remember, this is Sarah Carter, and we are taking back the story. Thank you so much for joining me today.